Welcome to the Central Asia Program Seminars. My name is uh, Sebastian Pierrouz. I'm the director of the Central Asia Program at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. So, uh, Serdar Berdi Mohamedov has been uh, president of uh, Turkmenistan for a year. He took over this position from his father after elections held uh, last year uh, on March 12th, which according to the Office for Democratic Institution and Human Rights, I mean, according to the ODIR, uh, which is part of the OSC, was uh, neither free nor fair nor competitive. But this succession raised a number of questions. What did this change mean uh, politically, economically, and socially? Uh, well, I mean, few big chances, uh, changes sorry, could be uh, expected. Serda was likely to maintain his father's policies and unchallenged power. Actually, he was already known for uh, the authoritarian way he exercised his authority in his multiple positions within the Turkmen administration. Moreover, it was expected that his father, Goban Gulibyan Mohamedov, would retain a strong influence, which remains the case. However, at the same time, Turkmenistan is facing a long-standing and uh, dire economic and social situation. And as hydrocarbon accounts for nine-tenths of Turkmenistan's export earnings, the 2014 fall in world hydrocarbon prices significantly uh, reduced the state budget and the COVID-19 pandemic further weakened Turkmenistan's economic situation and social welfare system, uh, including uh, the fair education and training systems. It exacerbated food insecurity uh, and it increased unemployment. And today, uh, difficult daily condition, the lack of employment opportunities has spurred between one and two million Turkmenistani citizens to, to immigrate. So this difficult situation raises a number of questions. How does the new president plan to manage this difficult context, which threatens the security of the population, but which could also eventually challenge the security of the regime? So a year later, uh, what policy has Serdar Berdi Mohamed have pursued? There would be, of course, many topics to, to discuss, and for obvious reasons, we won't be able to address all of them, but we decided today uh, to focus less on issues that are often discussed and are uh, more well-known, such as uh, foreign policy issues, energy issues, gas exports. And we're gonna focus more on domestic issues, including uh, the labor market, education, health, food security, environment, and generally speaking, how daily life of Turkmeni people has been, uh, has been impacted or not uh, by, uh, by Serdar's, by Bernie Mohamedov's policy. And also how the people of Turkmenistan see their, their rights and responsibility, and maybe to assess the role and the engagement of the international community uh, in Turkmenistan. So uh, to do that, we have three great specialists uh, on Turkmenistan, Professor Luka Antseski, uh, Ms. Aina Badiyay-Limova, and Mr. Uslan Torbatulin. Uh, our speakers will present, I guess, about 15 minutes. And after the presentations, we'll have a QA and a session. So please feel free to send your question in the, in the chat box. So thank you all for being with us today. It seems that uh, uh, Le Professor Luke Anceski hasn't joined us yet, might have some issues to connect. So maybe we'll go, we'll start uh, with our uh, with uh, uh, Ainabat uh, Yai Limova, who is a founder and is executive director of Seglik.org and uh, the, of the Progress Foundation. Uh, the Progress Foundation works to support uh, various initiatives that enhance the public's access in Turkmenistan. 
over the past 12 years, segli.org, uh, which is an initiative of the Progress Fund Foundation, has been working to improve public health literacy in Turkmenistan and progress online and an online an analytical journal that promotes understanding of social societal trends in Turkmenistan by providing quality research and policy analysis. And before that, Ainabat worked as program manager of the Europe and Central Asia Pro program at the Bank Information Center, uh, which is a World Bank watchdog in Washington, D.C. In uh, Turkmenistan, she co-founded and led the Alliance for Responsible Community Action, which is an organization dedicated to promoting civic education. So thank you so much for being with us today. And I know that the floor is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. Can you hear me? Yes. So, um... Well, let me start by posing this question. What does it mean to be young in Turkmenistan? What, what does it mean to be young in Turkmenistan in today with all systemic failures that are going on and imagine your future in it? So I've been thinking about the ways to approach this presentation with the best knowledge that I have and we focus on at Progress Foundation. So the, I will continue my list by asking the audience, what options are there given the situation in economy, public health, and education in Turkmenistan? 55% of the population in Turkmenistan is under 30. So Sirdar Birdun Khamedov inherited and continued with dysfunctional form of uh, a dysfunctional government system and public administration. It's synonymous with corruption and with government ministries and agencies that have no channels of hearing and communicating with the public. So young people in Turkmenistan feel stuck. This general sense that the government and the ministries, the state are not working for them for their future. Dr. Mohamedov's administration does not represent young people, both in numbers and policy decisions. President Bebu Mohamedov chose to continue with antiquated policies with some sort of mixture of failed Soviet uh, practices and a an ultra-conservative uh, traditionalism. There is no consideration of young people's needs by the leadership. Most of the young people in Turkmenistan end up achieving what they achieve in spite of many roadblocks that have been created by the system. Young people lost all faith in the system. They do not believe that they matter. That's why they choose to leave the country. Many people who I went to school with are no longer in Turkmenistan. And over the last year, I keep hearing um, a lot of stories when young people go, go to uh, Turkmenistan to renew their passports and their relatives, friends, and family members say their goodbyes by advising them not to come back. So this tells you the level of the hopelessness in the country. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm concerned and very much preoccupied these days about what we're losing in terms of skills and, and uh, people in Turkmenistan. What will happen to institutions where gaps have been left in hospitals and schools? I really hope that something will fundamentally change for young people in Turkmenistan to feel that they have a future in the country. Serdar Birdu Mohamedov continued with old recipe and ingredients of governance. Unhearing government with heavy dose of poor quality propaganda, fear and violence, with uh, all put together with a sick, thick source of corruption. Not a single story, news has been published in the state media in 2022, raising the problems and issues that matter for average Turkmen. Birdu Mohamedov's administration further isolates the country, both economically, financially, and intellectually. Turkmenistan continues to suffer from data anemia, Data that is vital for policymaking and decision making is not publicly available. The IMF and the World Bank continue excluding the country from its reports due to lack of credible data. The narrative of zero COVID infections and death in Turkmenistan continue. There are no plans to release the results of the uh, census that happened in, 20, in 2012 and the, new, and the last one that happened in December 2022. No reform has been taken to address the dual exchange rate of the Manad, of Manad that has devastating impact on the population and business. Strict currency control con continues. 
So the Sardar Bedou Muhammad inherited annual, the annual, an annual inflation rate of over 50% in 2021. In 2022, the inflation, according to our, our Palo Index run by Progress Foundation, the inflation went down by 11% as a result of command and, command and control economic measures. The cost of food remains high. Purchasing power of the population has significantly declined over the five years, over the last five years. The black market exchange rate is six times higher than the official exchange rate. The government intensified in 2022 internet shutdown and it's internet shutdowns and is trying to build internet to seal off the population from modernity and science. In 2022, there were four internet shutdowns registered in Turkmenistan by independent groups. When internet is not shut down in Turkmenistan, it's only it only exists in its name because it's painstakingly slow, prohibitively costly, and aggressively censored. Travel restrictions continue in practice and exacerbated by the situation that there, that there are many Turkmen walk around the world uh, or, or outside of Turkmenistan, walk around with expired uh, Turkmen passport. And the government introduced Turkey in September to introduce a visa for citizens of Turkmenistan after many years of visa travel, visa free travel between the countries. And last but not least, April, May 2022 has witnessed the unprecedented campaign to control and restrict women's and girls' choices, a way of life in Turkmenistan. Each wave of it lived, leaves uh, both women, girls, and men deeply traumatized. It's important to note that the government in 2022, under the pressure from United Nations, has accepted the issue of domestic endemic domestic violence in Turkmenistan by releasing a long overdue report, which has not been followed by any public communication or education. All this is happening while the international community is watching these developments by keeping silent. No international organization, no country has ever publicly called on the government to comply with reason, logic, and its obligations to its citizens. Truthful reports written by international actors do not match their actions in practice. This business, as usual, deepens stagnation, isolation, and further exacerbates the brain drain, brain drain that will have devastating impact on human capital in Turkmenistan for decades. I see very little interest in engagement of international research institutions with Turkmen. There is no interest to learn about uh, learn about Turkmen, how they think and what they think. So we we as Turkmen, from my observation and tw more than twenty years of work on Turkmenistan, see that we are only seen by outsiders, by our by degrees of our opposition to the government and our thinking on future pipeline routes. This has turned Turkmenistan into a pariah, pariah state in terms of research and analysis, which is much needed for informed and constructive public engagement. But unfortunately, this doesn't happen. But uh, this is not all. This is not happening uh, at the moment. But this doesn't have to be this way. International organizations and diplomats in Turkmenistan should meet less behind the closed doors and produce research and data as. A, as a result of the engagement with the government. This is not happening at the moment. International watchdog organizations should shed light on what international organizations are doing and not doing in Turkmenistan. Saglik has been playing that role by continuing to ask the WHO and the World Bank to provide access to COVID information in Turkmenistan. Progress's Palav Index, a food inflation tracker, tries to make sense of economic realities in the country where data is not available. And I'll stop here, Sebastian. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Uh, I have an issue with my, uh, with my computer. So let's move. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's move to the third uh, third speaker, who is now going to be the second speaker, Ruslan Turbatulin, who is the editor-in-chief at Chronicles of Turkmenistan, which is one of Turkmenistan's few 
independent news outlets covering human rights, social, political, and economic issues, and other topics in uh, Turkmenistan. Ruslan is the author of many analytical articles on the politics of Turkmenistan. And since 2012, he's been a full-time member of the human rights organization, Turkmen Initiative for Human Rights, which is based uh, in Vienna, in Austria. Ruslan, thank you very much for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Hi, um, uh, one second. So uh, yes, my name is Ruslan Tuchbaturin and I'm an editor at Chronicles of Turkmenistan news outlet. Oh, thank you, Sebastian, um, Karganish and all others who have organized this round table. I'm honored to participate in an event alongside with Dr. Anseski and Ms. Ainabat Yelimova. Um, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really used to talking in front of the audience, which is probably uh, kind of strange for a journalist, so I apologize in advance for uh, starters and um, awkward pauses if they arise, if I cannot find the correct word. Anyways, uh, let me get back to the topic. Uh, well, our website is one of the biggest news sources on Turkmenistan. Well, not that, that we have too much comp competitors, of course, uh, and we've been closely monitoring social, economical, and political situation in Turkmenistan since Sardar Berdi Mohamedov came to power, which on which I have a kind of a con con controversial opinion, which I think he didn't inherit any power, but I'll get back to it later. Uh, there were some important event, events since this power transition, but uh, not a whole lot has really changed in Turkmenistan, to be honest. Uh, most important news um, story that made a lot of buzz in foreign media happened in spring last year, right after Serdar Birdi Mohamedov's inauguration. Um, in, Turkmenistan, uh, in Turkmenistan campaign um, for, how should I put it, uh, for, uh, for women's morality has started. Um, and women were forbidden not just to drive cars, but in some cases even occupy the front seat of the car. Also, there was a ban on using certain cosmetical procedures, um, like um, under skin injections, I, uh, I think those are called. Uh, many beauty salons were inspected by the police officers and some of them were closed. Uh, but these um, were kind of verbal orders. Um, there were no written laws supporting these newly introduced rules, which means that they are not kind of legitimate, but police officers are, are, were still demanding to obey them. Um, and this situation is very typical for Turkmenistan. When um, someone from high above wants to force his moral views on people of the country without any legislative base supporting uh, these new rules. Um, they uh, introduced these vo so-called vocal uh, rules or vocal laws. Uh, the best example is with, you know, the, with the white cars in the country. Uh, in Turkmenistan, people are uh, allowed only to drive white cars, although there's no written law banning other car colors, but still, Every car on the road is in Turkmenistan is white. Uh, and usually these campaigns um, that are based on the verbal orders last for a month, maybe two, and then they kind of fade away and police officers uh, kind of uh, suddenly stop caring about those uh, new rules. And now um, women are again using all sorts of makeup and plastic surgeries. Uh, I mean, the, the beauty procedures uh, that which were banned. Um, uh, but still, it was kind of a um, imp very important story that shows the how uh, the the government perceives women and their rights. Um, Another important event that uh, happened last year is that Turkmen authorities have proactively asked Turkey to introduce visas to Turkmen citizens who priorly could travel to Turkey without visas. I mean, Ainabat has already mentioned it, but still. Um, uh, officially, Turkmen Ministry of Foreign Affairs claims that this uh, does not hinder people's rights to freedom, uh, freedom of movements, but it rather improves their security abroad. 
Um, in reality, of course, the reason was the raise of opposition groups, acti uh, groups activities in Turkey. Turkmen citizens uh, were left in Turkey when Turkmenistan closed its borders, even to its own citizens, actually, uh, due to COVID restrictions. So people were left without any sort of support and means to survive in a foreign country. And this led to their um, uh, disappointment, their, their dismay, and uh, to many anti-government uh, demonstrations in Turkey and also other countries. So in order to uh, have more control over potential growth of opposition groups in Turkey, Turkmen authorities have asked to introduce visas. Um, so that was the second uh, big uh, news piece. And the last important event that I wanted to bring up is the release of several political prisoners that were pardoned by presidential decree at the end of the last year. Among them were lawyer Pigamberdi Alaberdiev, who was sentenced for six years in uh, 2020. Officially, he was arrested for um, hooliganism, I think it's called uh, correctly, and um, that he has injured, uh, injured someone. Well, in reality, he was suspected to have contacts with opposition groups abroad. Um, also, um, at the same time, Dr. Hursanay Ismatulayeva, who was um, was also released uh, in 2021, she was sentenced for nine years. Officially, she was arrested for um, fraud and uh, um, uh, for forging uh, fake uh, some kind of a fake document. In reality, uh, she was arrested for contacting uh, editorial uh, of a foreign independent news outlet and telling openly about corruption in um, medical sphere. Uh, I'm not, there are still a lot, a lot more, of course, political prisoners in Turkmenistan, but um, I'm not totally sure why these two were released. Uh, and please don't get me wrong, this is a great news and I'm really, really happy it happened. But the thing is, it's not very clear what made Turkmen authorities pardon them. It never happened uh, before. So my guess is that it was a result of uh, EU Turkmen Turkmenistan human rights dialogue, which happened about a month before uh, these people were pardoned. Our uh, and other uh, human rights organizations have sent EU delegation information on certain human rights issues in Turkmenistan, including names of these political uh, prisoners and their cases. So probably it is the EU we have to thank for uh, release of Alagardiv Al and Ismatullayeva. Um, anyways, uh, these were the most, in my opinion, noticeable events since Serdar uh, became the president. But other than that, not a lot has changed. In I mean, in general, many people were uh, disappointed because they were expecting that new uh, young leader would bring new blood and modernize the government. Um, uh, in particular, people were, for example, expecting that he would uh, um, equalize uh, official and black market exchange rates, which would make foreign money transfers possible again and make life uh, for businessmen a lot easier. Well, that unfortunately didn't happen. Uh, people were expecting reopening of the borders and that they would uh, at last have a chance to return home. Well, this kind of did happen, but only about a month ago, maybe two. Uh, and um, this happened when COVID pandemic kind of stopped being uh, a thing uh, in general. So that is not, I think, Serdar's uh, achievement. Um, also, many hope that internet restrictions would uh, ease a little, but in reality, they are actually strengthening. Uh, the, uh, it became a lot more difficult to connect to internet uh, since uh, since last year. So in general, uh, except for portraits, uh, everything else stayed the same, uh, if not worse. And uh, the reason for it is, uh, so this is the, my controversial opinion, is that I don't think uh, Serdar has inherited power uh, with the chair. Um, Serdar became the president, but he does not rule in Turkmenistan, it seems like uh, his father does, this still does. Serdar has, hasn't shown, so we've been monitoring closely um, 
what he does, how he does it. So we've been looking uh, closely to the um, state propaganda and uh, the news from our own sources. And uh, Serdar hasn't shown any sign of, in, of his independence. Um, all he does is cosplay his father. He didn't gather a team of new faces in the government. There were some switches uh, in ministers' cabinet last year, but um, no new members of the cabinet were actually uh, introduced. There were only old people working in the government. Old, I mean by old, I, I don't mean their age, but rather that they were working since uh, 2000s. To, uh, they, they started kind of working with his father, Gorban Guli. Um, Serdar also conducts ministers' meetings in the exact same way and the exact same days of the week like his father did before him. He even uses the same exact words and phrases when talking to uh, or reprimanding um, members of the government. Uh, when when Serdar receives foreign delegations, uh, uh, important guests also meet his father before or after meeting with Serdar. Uh, if Serdar travels abroad, uh, he's always accompanied by a uh, head of foreign ministry, uh, Rashid Miryadov, who is, uh, who uh, I believe is his mentor, and he's the only person in Turkmen government who has, um, who has never changed. He was never reprimanded or even criticized by uh, Gurban Guliberti Mohamedov. Uh, so I really don't think that Serdar makes any sort of important decisions uh, while his father continues to rule under, well, different titles, be that uh, head of the Senate, I mean, the um, Halt Maslahati, is, is, which is called Halt Maslahati in Turkmenistan, so the, the upper chamber, or now he has become, he kind of proclaimed, proclaimed himself a national leader, um, and I, to be honest, I don't think the situation is going to change anytime soon um, if this trend continues. So um, Serdar is still going to be, you know, acting as if he was a president and all the most important decisions will be made by his um, uh, father, uh, Gurban Guli, uh, who is now a national leader, which means that he's kind of above everyone else but this is a very strange uh, situation with Halk Maslahati in general in Turkmenistan so this is considered to be the highest representative organ in Turkmenistan which is kind of above the the uh, the parliament uh, but also is not very uh, is not transparent at all uh, so yeah uh, I would I think stop there um, and if any questions arise, I would be happy to answer them later. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Ruslan. And I mean, uh, so it seems that uh, Professor Anseski hasn't been able to join us. Maybe it's gonna be, he's gonna join us a little bit later. Let's see. So uh, we're gonna uh, move to, to the questions, but first I would like uh, again to, to thank you very much. I mean, you already addressed uh, many points and this raises many questions, of course, for the Turkmen governments, but also as you were uh, talking about Ruslan, about what is Serdar's political autonomy, taking here into account that his father continues to hold uh, many of the powers and who seems to be trying even uh, in recent weeks to come back even more on the political uh, arena. And also another question is how the population can be more involved, uh, taking into account the authoritarianism and the risks to engage this country uh, in any kind of uh, independent political activity. And another question is how can the international community be uh, more involved? Uh, by the way, I'd like to recommend uh, a paper entitled The Aura of Governance in Turkmenistan, uh, which is uh, which has been authored by one of the best specialists on Turkmenistan, Victoria Clement. Where this paper was published two, year, two days ago on the Diplomat website, and this paper makes a very good point on the situation of Turkmenistan, including its engagement of the uh, foreign community. So uh, uh, there are, of course, questions. I have questions. <laughs> 
please, so feel free to send uh, as many questions as you as you want. Let's start. I mean, there are some questions about the status of uh, religion. So, can you could you say a few words elaborate on the status of religions and beliefs in Turkmenistan? Is the regime involved in religious affairs and in people's spiritual practices overall? And what is the relationship between Muslim religious authorities and the government? Who wants to answer? Aina, but you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I can. We're, so we need to understand that this is a deeply atomized uh, society, isolated from outside influences, in both in, in terms of information and interaction. So when we talk about religious life, or civic life, it's strictly controlled. Yes, you practice your religion in a strictly controlled format, um, in strictly restricted spaces, mosques, churches, they do exist. People go to mosques, people go to church, ch churches, uh, Russian Orthodox Church, uh, other churches. Um, but it's, it's just like any other civic activity, it's strictly regulated. Uh, where we can stay, uh, yeah. So that's that's a that's that's just the features of a classic closed authoritarian system applies to Turkmenistan. There's, there's, there are no exceptions there. Just like in any in any other country that is, uh, you know, pursuing this, you know, following pursuing this regime, you know. Yeah, Ruslan, please add. So uh, regarding religion, um, the thing is that uh, religion. So how should I put it and not be um, the the the, the um, main uh, common so to say um, religions are not forbidden like the Christianity or um, Islam. But the thing is that um, only the the traditional in in the in the views of the government only traditional islam is allowed in turkmenistan so he uh, berdi mohamedov is highly religious guy um uh, he uh, builds mosques um he is uh, following all the muslim traditions like yesterday he was he may uh, he has given a sadaqa uh, because of um the tragic events in turkey uh, it may, led to many victims of the earthquake and uh, well, yeah, he is a religious guy, but he, but it, uh, the thing is that the, the, as Ainabat said, the the overall the religion groups are strictly controlled in Turkmenistan, so they are afraid of um, uh, potential uh, extremist groups, probably. Uh, well, at least they um, claim that that's the the reason they are trying to you know keep an eye on on the religious groups, but. Uh, also, of course, they uh, forbid the um, lesser known or, or um, kind of smaller religious groups, like the Jehovah's Witness, is is not allowed in Turkmenistan. The many were uh, they are not registered. I mean, uh, many uh, followers of the of this religions were imprisoned because they don't didn't want to serve um, uh, the mil military. In the military, uh, fortunately, many of them were released last year, I think. Uh, but still, um, if you're uh, following the traditional uh, Islam, well, it's you're kind of are free to uh, uh, to exercise your religion. But if you are kind, if you deviate from the certain uh, approved path, well, you're gonna be under a surveillance thank you Ruslan. the next question is uh, does a tribal identity play uh, play a role in the current government anyone can answer this question uh well people think I'm 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 not being a Turkmen ethnically, so I'm not really familiar with the uh, the tribal structure in Turkmenistan. Not too deep, but it seems like people are uh, not happy that, and they they say that 
the Berdi Mohamedov, who is uh, a Teke from the Teke tribe, I think. And um, he is promoting only his own people and uh, suppress, kind of suppressing uh, representatives or other uh, tribe members. Uh, but uh, it's not that we do, I don't have any um, kind of uh, proof of that or I, uh, certain uh, nothing happened that sh would show that he's uh, strictly against other tribes. Although he, it seems like he promotes his own people from his own. Thank you, Ruslan. Ainabe, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, on um, on tribal, the question um, tribalism, it's we just simply don't know. So these are the questions needs to be researched and addressed by researchers who have access to information based in the in the West. These are the things that we need to study. We can speculate about it, but it has not been it has not been researched. We don't have information, but which is possible. Just want to step back and add one sentence on religions, if I may, Sebastian. Sure. Just, um, um, from from the discussions in, in on social media among Turkmen, it's it's increasingly easier to be to to make religious statements than to be a secular. This is a very interesting uh, recent, not a recent development, but it's been going on for many years, but now more and more people on social media. So you can see that among youth, it's more, ex it's more accepted to be outwardly religious than to be secular. And there are more attacks on I mean, I, I've never even seen anybody, in, in, in very rarely I see Turkmen uh, young stating that, you know, I'm secular, or there will be something citing from the constitution saying, saying that, you know, we are a secular state, and the person will be attacked saying, no, you know, but we are, we're traditionally Muslim society. So this is very interesting trends that are happening there. I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Ainabad. So uh, we have several questions on foreign policy, so let's try maybe to address some of them. The first one is, do you think that the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan will impact Turkmenistan in some way? And what are the current relations between the government of Turkmenistan and the Taliban? <clears throat> if I'm, I don't, I'm not researching that issue, so I don't have any information to speculate on that, and I don't even think that anybody has full information on that to speculate so but we, we do there is a um um there's conservative trends there's little exchange at people to people level between afghanistan and turkmenistan so the, but there are trends that um in social life uh in terms of status of the woman uh diminishing private and public spaces that really makes you think about like, you know, the influence of tal Talibanism and Talibans in Turkmenistan. But at this, uh, maybe Luca can address that, but I, I don't have any information on that. No worries. Rusla, do you want to say anything about that? Well, well not really. As Ainabat has mentioned, there's not, of, not a lot of information and Tur Turkmen uh, media is being really vague about uh, the, the the deals with uh, Afghanistan that, that like for example the uh, Tapi pipeline is the main uh, project that Talibans are interested in and they are trying to force uh, they are always reminding Turkmen government that well maybe we should carry on maybe we should go on maybe we should start over come on let's do it fast because it's uh, they hope that it would bring uh, a lot of um, money for uh, the gas transports to the government uh, Taliban government, but other than that, um, not a lot to not a lot to tell. There is there are I, at least for now there are no tensions. It seems like, but um, it, they are not really friends, but they are not enemies, but rather regular. Thank no. you. 
Thank you so much. So, uh, Professor Anseski uh, could join us. So, thank you, Luca. Welcome to uh, to, uh, to to the seminar. So, I'm going to give you the the floor. Uh, Luca Anseski, Professor Luca Anseski, teaches uh, Central Asian Studies at the University of Glasgow. He also credits uh, Europe Asia Studies, which is uh, the world's most established academic journal for Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies. Uh, Luca was educated in Nepal and Melbourne. He is the author of an excellent book, Turkmenistan's Foreign Policy, Positive Neutrality, and the Consolidation of the Turkmen Regime, which was published in 2009 with Ruth Ledge. And he's currently completing a research monograph on the role of Eurasianism in the making of Kazakhstan's foreign policy. And his articles have been published in many journals, including Europe Asia Studies, Democratizatia, Nationalities Papers, and Central Asian Survey. And before joining the University of Glasgow, uh, Luca lectured in international relations at Le Trobe University in Melbourne, where from 2012 to 2013, he held a Discovery Early Career Fellowship awarded by the Australian Research Council. So Luca, welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, first of all, let me apologize. We got confused with the time zone. I teach one to three, so obviously, you know, I had to rush back when I got the message from Karligash, but apologies both to the other people, but mostly to my co-speakers because I missed what they had to say. So I hope that my, my argument is not going to uh, clash too much with what they already said. So now, I and I'm going to be quick because I know that we should with time anyhow. So my consideration about assessing the first 12 months of Perdi Mohamedov Jr. rule is that we learned quite a few things about the weakness of the Turkmen regime, as well as the difficulty of implementing a dynastic succession in Eurasia while they defined. Because if the year started with this uh, enthusiasm in the regime for the accession to power of the Sertar, in the last couple of months, we heard more and more uh, rumors about how elite infight actually rolled power back from Sertar into a kind of more uh, collective, if you want, form of regime, which is very much centered onto the very, very moment of family widely defined, which means that the elite that uh, is ruling Turkmenistan, has been ruling Turkmenistan now for, for 15 or more than 50 years, is not as unified as we thought it would be. The pacts, the elite agreements that led to the rise to power of Sertar have now been put into question by what we hear are problems between Bertin Mohamedov senior and the, the, the wider family, particularly his, his, his siblings. And there has been a redistribution of presidential, presidential competencies, which is not only institutionally based, but it's also structurally moved power away from the presidency. Uh, in that sense, we've seen the cracks that exist in the way in which the, 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 the Tukman elite uh, operates. Obviously, you know, to go back to the remit you told me to address, Sebastian, uh, I would say that uh, while we are not sure who are the winners and losers in the elite in fighting, we are sure that there is a big uh, loser here as the Tukman people, because they're gonna endure uh, possible, you know, obviously a, a protracted period of authoritarian, uh, controlled by the regime, a regime which has become even more repressive. I mean, we heard the stories about uh, those women that protested a couple of days ago and they got arrested, even they knew they were going to get arrested, but they had to make the point about issues that they wanted to, to, to bring forward. We hear about the restriction continuing post on the Turkmen citizens who want to leave the country. So now, you know, we heard more about how more difficult to get into, to, to more go into Turkey, which makes the country an open air prison. And this is the kind of backdrop that we see uh, and we're witnessing when it comes to the, uh, the transition, which has essentially failed because uh, we now have a situation which 
uh, a regime that feels much less safe, much less secure, a regime that now has to walk back some of the um, pacts that they made in, in 2022, uh, except the equally repressive, the equally uh, violent, the, 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 the very form of total control that they have been instigated so far. And one more thing, which I think has been, has been another lesson that we learned when it comes to, to the Serdar, um, to the Serdar um, rule, is the fact that we now see the economic interest of the elite, of the, of the state, the Tukmen state, being framed in increasingly narrower terms. So we now see that what really matters is the interest of the clique that's it's in power, uh, even now a click, and you could say, well, it's been there for a long time, but it seemed to me that what we see in, in, the, in the last 12 months is this increasing uh, nepotism and this increasing corruption it becoming even more evident. So these are all trends, by the way, that were already established, it were already visible in at the time of the Bangui rule. So this is nothing new. It's not the regime has changed the, the governance style. But what we have is a situation in which those trends were accelerated, then they now become even more visible. And that's something which, again, has got one big loser that the population at, at, at large. The energy, the energy policy remained the same, very much monodimensional, you know, the China monopsony. There is no serious effort at diversification. The, the degree of isolation in the politics of the place become uh, foreign policy its maximum. And this really, and I'm gonna briefly go towards the conclusion of my thoughts, is uh, it, it's made this country one of the most, uh, well, closed, and continue to do so, and the regime one of the most intractable in the world. And if you just allow me one final thought about uh, this, because you know I always regard Turkmenistan as a, as a laboratory of authoritarian innovation. So the, the technique that, the authoritarian technique that gets tried into Turkmenistan, you know, one for all is the one about COVID that never existed there. Those exist, those, those techniques become successful elsewhere. I think that one of the lessons that the other, other Eurasian teams, the other Eurasian regimes have um, learned or they learn is that dynastic transitions are difficult to execute and even more difficult to be kept in power because it's now clear to everyone that was going that was going to is not smooth, not smooth sailing, that there are cracks in the elite, and maybe moving from father to son is not a good solution after all. So apologies again for being late, but thanks a lot for your attention. No worries at all, Luca. We're so happy to have you on the seminar. So thank you for your for your presentation. So let's maybe focus a little bit on uh, domestic issues. And I'd like to come back. I mean, Aina Bat addressed that a little bit, but uh, let's come back on the access to uh, information of the Turkmen population to information. So there is, of course, the internet, but which remains, as you said, largely censored. Uh, people use the VPNs, but there has been a crackdown on VPNs with even police controlling people on the street. I mean, controlling their checked phones, checking their cell phones. Also, by the way, there is no law prohibiting the use of VPNs in Turkmenistan. So the question is, to what extent the government's control of internet and uh, VPNs prevent people from accessing information? And generally speaking, so how do people access information from Turkmenistan? Is this to me or to Ruslan? Yeah, it can be any, any of you. Um, so there, I think there's several things that we should be asking. Uh, yes, there is, as I outlined, there were shutdowns, complete shut, internet shutdowns in 2022. Uh, there is a knowledge of VPN uh, by young people. Um, there is a strong uh, state propaganda, uh, not strong, it's actually poor quality, meaning in terms of numbers of it, um, overwhelming, available for Turkmen, for Turkmen citizens. The question is that even if they get that VPN and if they finally get access to internet, what is there in Turkmen language? 
So it's very, very few sources of quality information. Again, I'm, I would like to emphasize quality information in Turkmen on science, literature, on, on, on um, you know, any other aspect, not, not politics and economy, it's not there. So we're just kind of in this vicious cycle where we say, please, we need access to information. It's really bad that internet is being shut down. It should stop, yes, all this is true. But at the same time, there are projects in the country, the United Nations in the country, international organizations, but as a result of the engagement, um, um, it, it's not, we, we're not having quality information, you know? Government is not doing that. So, but at least the hope is that when international organizations engage with the government and ministries, they develop some sort of content, but it's not available. For example, WHO does something in the country and uh, runs an event seminar with doctors and treatment pro protocols are not there or any other content that will benefit the public. So yeah, I just wanted to add that there was a really crackdown on uh, VPN services in Turkmenistan last year. Um, so the, 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 the people who were uh, the, the regular uh, official VPN programs, which can be downloaded from App Store or anywhere else, are being forbidden uh, since a while ago. And um, thus, a uh, uh, new business was uh, uh, was doing great, so to say, in Turkmenistan, where the specialists have been creating their own VPN servers. But um, since last year, these were targeted by Turkmen officials, and they were um, these people were not arrested, but they were, you know, talked to by um, secret services. So they were forced to shut down their business and they were forced to um, give the names of other colleagues, so to say. And uh, also the, it seems like, like that they have started to use uh, DPI equipment, which means deep uh, packet inspection software or hardware. Uh, which uh, even further um, restricts, uh, introduced the internet re restrictions for uh, Turkmen uh, internet users. So uh, just to give you an example, um, uh, on our website, we were getting about uh, eight to 10,000 unique visitors a day beforehand, and now we get about 2,000. So that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a lot of people were seemingly banned. So uh, we didn't know how many people visit our website, which which was of course banned uh, beforehand. But now it seems like the majority of our visitors were from Turkmenistan, and they were now they cannot now access to our website. And probably the same picture is uh, other is seen on uh, also other uh, news resources about Turkmenistan. But, uh, but yeah, please, 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 I love it. Sure. Back to the same question. So I just would like to highlight the humanitarian aspect of it. It's one thing that you do not have access to general news in the country covered by independent opposition sources, but it's another issue when your child gets cancer and you have a few hours to act in research on a treatment, on access in the country or outside the country, and you do not have access to internet. So what we're seeing is that um, access to, uh, let's say hospitals in India or Turkey or United Nations, they're blocked. So this is the, when we talk about internet, we should, talk, we should think and talk about this aspects of shutdowns and restrictions when, when those vital resources, educational resources, medical resources are, are shut down. So um, yeah, that's, that's and, and for example, the internet is not a, a normal part integrated into the lives of doctors, for example, medical professionals in Turkmenistan. They, they don't, it's expensive, they, it's restricted and they do not use it for their professional work. Thank you. Uh, let's go on with uh, domestic issues, and we know that Turkmenistan has significant uh, environmental issues. So the question is, is there any chance that Turkmenistan will take some 
positive environmental steps and decrease, for example, methane emissions while trying to better capture uh, its gas. And generally speaking, if you could say a few words on the environmental issues, which are so important in Turkmenistan. Anyone wants to address that? So I just wanted to shortly say that they might now because it's it's become known of the problem. Uh, so it's now a big problem. So there were uh, like satellite images that captured a lot of methane leaks in Turkmenistan. And now since it became known, uh, they might, uh, you know, change something. But uh, it, it's not the new thing, of course. It's just now the, it's it's become known. And beforehand, they, the same thing has happened. I'm pretty sure of it, but uh, they didn't care to, uh, they didn't care about it at all. So now it might be uh, the time for them to change their mind about it. It, it, it. it might and it might not, because we have not seen any specific targets. So there are no targets, there's no data, there are no commitments, there are no pledges. So right now, yes, the, there are several, um, uh, groups, the British Embassy and, and others in Turkmenistan trying to push the government to by organizing workshops and meetings, but that's a regular stuff in Turkmenistan, but there's there are no numbers, there's no research, there's no understanding about the size of the problem, its impact, so it's, it's, it's very hard to be optimistic in that case. Uh, can I just... In of course, Rika. I actually uh, agree with Ruslan when he says that they, they may now do something because the problem emerged, because that's their track record. So if you look at this, it goes back to the Niazov years. The Niazov years, they, uh, they were still the Kyoto Protocol in X, so, you know, to report the emissions. And Turkmenistan, as a non annexed two states, did not, were not actually requested to report the emissions. But they understood that, that you know, in, in those years, so in the 90s particularly, reporting your emission was, was seen as an act of being a good international citizen. So they willingly shared those data, but they didn't, they never did share, they never report to other conventions they were part of, like against torture, the rights of women, the rights of children. So convention which had to do with the quality of the government. So the environmental issue for this regime, which has been continued for 30 years, has always been a kind of fig leaf. But first of all, an afterthought, so something not important, but to be challenged um, periodically. But also something which they periodically start to, to care about because they need to be seen as be doing something. So in that sense, this is a continuity between what was before and the current regime. So Ruslan is spot on on this. Thank you, Lucia. So uh, one very important question, I would like to come back. Uh, I know uh, talked a little bit about it, but I think it's very important, which is a question, which is about the status of women, which as I said, uh, greatly, uh, significantly, uh, very significantly deteriorated since the Abdi Mohamedov took over as president. I mean, we've seen that a series of measures have been taken, such as uh, restricting the use of cosmetics, even prohibiting women from sitting on the front seats in the cars. So the question is, uh, who is behind these measures? Is it really Serdar Birdi Mohamedov or uh, were these measures dictated to him by his father or by some conservative religious circles? And why are these extremely worrying measures taken against women now under Serdar Mohamedov? Or should we consider that it's in fact, the continuation of a longer process that began a long time ago, for example, even maybe since Niazov, since uh, as early as the 90s, uh, it seems that the status of women actually in Turkmenistan deteriorated already rapidly. So I don't know if, uh, I wonder if one of you could say a few words about that. I just want to remind that all what you witnessed in April and May, those are outward manifestations, because we've been following and monitoring the situation with 
access to sexual and reproductive health in Turkmenistan. So it's, that's been deteriorating over the last, I don't know how many years. So for example, access to abortion has been cut from 12 weeks to five weeks, right? So these, these are the kind of, they, those conversations, don't, they don't make headline news. Uh, so, but this is, this is what's happening. So it's basically when, um, so the, both private spaces and public spaces, private life of women get, get shrinking, but it's a very complex issue. There is, if so, I don't know, we don't know the answer. Where is this coming from, right? Because it is, as we've seen, as we, we are, so, sorry, Luca, I can, I'll go back because it's like I, we've been told that we're losers as a population and we, we, we feel like we have no agency, but that's not true. So we've been, yes, we've been told that we're losers, but the population has agency and there's also a population participating in this. So it's not, it's a very complex situation. It's not um, um, they're beneficiary, like uh, people who benefit from this and they're also enablers and both in population and in the government. But the most important thing that we can tell for sure that, that there is no guarantee that this will not be repeated in 2023. So these campaigns, there are no structure, no processes in place that, that it, will, it will not be repeated. It's going, it might happen in 2023, 2023, the year later or so, then that's what we should be having conversation about how to prevent this from happening again. Thank you. Anyone wants to add anything? No. Okay, so let's move uh, to uh, another question, which I think is very important. When talking about Turkmeni populations, we also need to talk about ethnic minorities. And uh, there is a strong uh, discrimination against them, including against uh, the main one, uh, that is the Uzbek minority. For example, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no Uzbek cultural center in the country. Uh, in this context, uh, how do ethnic minorities try to engage to defend their rights? Have you heard about some specific initiatives, uh, especially maybe recently under Biadi, uh, Serdar Biadi Mohamedov? No, not really. I mean, um, there are private gatherings, like, for example, uh, Tartars in Dashogus, at least. Uh, so me being a Tartar ethnically, um, uh, my grandma uh, is in contact with uh, with uh, with those. Um, there's a small group of women who are trying to uh, keep their uh, tra Tata traditions and so on. But but it's rather small uh, small group, and they, it's not uh, and they are not uh, activists or they they do not demand their rights or anything of sorts. They're just trying to you know maintain uh, and keep uh, their culture. Other than that, and the good example of um, kind of discrimination, I would say it's actual one. So now uh, they're in Turkmenistan, they're preparing for um, Mejlis elections, the parliamentary elections. And I've been browsing through the names of the candidates. Um, all women are wearing the Turkmen national clothes and all family names and the names of the candidates are seen to be uh, well, uh, traditionally Turkmen, and uh, it seems like there are no other ethnic minorities uh, are even trying to participate in these elections. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying that you we, we have to assume their uh, ethnic um, identity based on the names, but it kind of kind of shows a little uh, the, the the politics. Thank you, Sam. The next que question, maybe a point on uh, the COVID-19. Uh, so the Turkmen government never recognized the presence of the virus on the Turkmen territory, although we have so many information, so many reports on the fact that the country has unfortunately been very seriously impacted by the virus. So could you say a few words about where are we now? I mean, uh, is the virus controlled? Uh, and could the international community maybe play a role in uh, helping Turkmenistan on this point? <clears throat> I mean, I can speak based on our experience and work. So 
yes, the government, the narrative, the government narrative of zero COVID infection and death continue in Turkmenistan. So the um, no, as I said, no international organization, including WHO and the World Bank, because the World Bank has provided a $20 million uh, loan to Turkmenistan to, to address COVID, which government is not accepting officially. Um, so there, there, are, there are several engagements like that. USAID got, was engaged in this with funding. So we keep asking for public access to information. It's not happening uh, as a result of engagement of international organizations. Um, we are viewed suspiciously. Uh, a lot of international organizations don't even want to engage. So we have to you know, have intermediaries or Western organizations bringing show that you know, we're legitimate, we're asking legitimate questions. So there, a lot of can be done by um, watchdog organizations based in the West. To, to ask um, uh, WHO and uh, World Bank. Again, is, again, is um, United Nations uh, calls on the government in Uzbekistan when domestic, on, on issues of domestic violence, for example, or, or COVID, but it never happens in Turkmenistan. So that's a, that's a mystery can quickly be, can be resolved by, uh, by international community. Yes, its government is not uh, has not reported, and no epidemiological report has been uh, shared. Um, people, public moved on. Uh, people are acting that COVID is over now. Um, there are no, there never been any reports of tests officially. Uh, right now, tests when you, anybody asks about COVID tests is non-existent in Turkmenistan. So the, both the population and the government is. Uh, as acting as if there will be no more infections in the future of, of COVID or any other or any other type of infection. Thank you, Aina. But Luca? Sebastian, I, I want to make a few points because I have a research sure. project or project on this. And I mean, so far, you know, I've only been here for half an hour. This is, is a seminar about denied rights, you know, minorities, religious, political rights. Public health is also a human right. And what we've seen throughout the pandemic is that this right to public health has been systematically denied in the Turkmen context, mostly through disinformation. Uh, the erasure, well, first of all, the denial of the pandemic, the erasure of those who died, uh, the, 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 the transformation of the regime from the main culprit situation into the supposed protector of Turkmenistan and all the narratives that came from, from the elite have just compounded a situation in which the, the, the population has not received any kind of support and, uh, and during the pandemic. And of course, the, the reality is that, uh, particularly in 2020, 2021, uh, you had this, you know, this particular situation in which uh, we, we all knew, I mean, the colleagues who are from Turkmenistan, they had relatives, they would do first, but I spoke with journalists and stuff, we all knew there were cases there and we knew, but the government never, never acknowledged that. And it seems to me that this is one of those areas in which uh, perhaps our judgment of an already abysmal regime must be even harsher. Uh, because the, the situation is that uh, even a, a pandemic means that every one of us gets affected in one way or the other by the, the uh, COVID. But, in, in the view of, in, in the way in which the Turkmen government perceived their own uh, stability and their own uh, strength, there was no space for, for this virus. And, you know, I looked at the document, I looked at the discussion of coronavirus that happened within the, within the Turkmen of Kabila Misa, which is, you know, the, the political locus by excellence, you know, and for months they never talked about it. And then at one point they talked about coronavirus, but it was a pandemic that what, what happened elsewhere, never in Turkmenistan. And then all of a sudden, in late 2020, they started to say, well, the president has been excellent in uh, keeping the, the, the pandemic out. And the, 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 this glorification, this cult of personality of the president, the ministers applauding him, has been particularly detrimental at this time of COVID. So in all this, the, the, the very wide range of uh, rights denied to the Turkmen citizen, 
I think the public health is one that particularly lately has been most, most uh, dangerous in that sense. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, we have only a few more minutes, but uh, I would like to address a question, which is uh, the Turkmen diaspora. We know that we have between one and two million documents who live abroad today. And this raises uh, many questions about especially maybe their interaction with the documents who remain uh, in the country. So the question is, can Turkmen abroad exert some kind of influence on the country? Or could they, for example, help people uh, who remain in Turkmenistan to defend their rights? How can they be involved or are they involved? Um, can I start or sure, about sure, yeah, please go ahead. I just I just wanted to say that um, you know this pandemic uh, situation when uh, where uh, as I've mentioned before the the people the Turkmen migrants who, who of which there's a lot in Turkey they have um, stayed they they had to they were left in Turkey without any means to survive so they were starting to gather. Uh, opposition or uh, activist groups and opposition groups, and they were starting to become very, very vocal about it. They were, uh, um, uh, you know, making all these uh, protests in front of the Turkmen um, embassy in, in in Istanbul. So, and till now, they're really active in at least in social uh, media, and it seems like the, the numbers are kind of growing despite the uh, the government trying them to you know to to shut them down and to, till now to which it has led to unfortunately rather more restrictions but it kind of that's that's the way the civil society emerges actually so they have to um keep doing something so they're not doing anything wrong they are not they're just demanding their rights and if and oftentimes they're being victimized. I mean, not victimized, but rather they're being blamed for a new, uh, newly introduced restrictions, like the, for example, visas for the, for the Turkey. And uh, many people say that, well, these activists are to blame for this. But uh, actually, I think that's that's not the case. It's the, like the victim blaming, and that's what what is kind of concerning. But uh, on the other hand, this is how again, this is how the, the civil society emerges. I, I think. Thank you, Ruslan. Anyone want? Yeah, Inabel, please go ahead. Yes. So in our work, we see um, several things. So first of all, the international community based in Turkmenistan can play this role of uh, bringing civil society that is based outside closer to the government in explaining um, in it. I don't know in which format, but I feel that it's doable that it's not, it can be a solution to the problems, okay? It's, it doesn't have to be all about political rights and human rights, but there are a lot of economic rights. I highlighted the economic situation, which not talked enough um, out, uh, outside of the country or social issues or what youth faces, right? Young people face. So that's one possibility there. Um, generally, there's, there's no investment by international community, of course, by no investments by government, but also by international community in capacity of civil society. There's very low civil society capacity to produce high, high level content, research, fact checking. These things needs to be, you know, some investments needs to be done into this. And then the third major thing that I see, for example, is that when we say civil society, the agendas are usually not focused on institution building. It's usually targeted at, uh, which is which has its place. I'm not saying that it should not be there, but um, getting rid of one person. Let's let's get rid of this person. Let's get usually it's not ministries trying to get rid of uh, Sirdar Bildu Muhammad or his family, right? But what? What is, but when you ask what, what institutions would you like to have? What, what institutions, like for example, in the context of Saglit, we would like to have a working Ministry of Health, right? By, by, by just removing one person, it's not going to happen because there are no processes. So 
institution building is not even a, in a language. So these things needs to be, uh, uh, you know, helped with, for, with uh, Turkmen's needs help with, with understanding it. I'm not saying shaping the agenda, but shaping this, this type of work. Thank well, you. I just Ruth wanted to say that I totally, to totally agree with Aina about what she, about Aina about had to say. So, I mean, we're running out of time. I'm just going to give a chance to Lucia. Do you want to add anything, Lucia? Okay. All right. So, uh, unfortunately, we need uh, we need to uh, to conclude. Uh, so, I would really like to thank our three speakers for their presentation, for the discussion. I would also like to thank them for their dedication and for their permanent commitment to to work on this extremely interesting country, to bring information, to bring analysis on Turkmen population, despite the difficulties of uh, working on this country. I very strongly recommend uh, to check uh, regularly Ainabad and Ruslan's website, which are so informative, uh, which provide in really uh, incredible information on Turkmenistan. And I, of course, uh, very strongly recommend to read Lucas uh, Ansetsky's many uh, excellent publications on Turkmenistan and on Central Asia. Uh, I would also like to thank our audience for being with us today, as usual, and for their questions, for the discussions. And we look forward to having you again in one of our upcoming uh, Central Asia program uh, seminars. Thank you very, very much, all of you, and uh, goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you.